Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Dr. Shubha, Professor of Anatomy from Kempegoda Institute of Medical Sciences, Bangalore. Today, I am going to talk about the anatomy of median nerve. Once a lady approached a doctor telling that she was pregnant about five and a half months and she had swelling in the body and severe pain in the palm. The doctor examined her and told her that the edema which was present in the palm was compressing one of the nerves and giving rise to the pain. The lady was worried. She told whether this happens to everybody during pregnancy and she has to bear this throughout her pregnancy. Doctor told her that he, you need not worry. Once the edema comes down, the automatically the nerve irritation will be less and she would not have any pain. So, the lady was relieved. Let us see which nerve can get compressed in the palm resulting in pain radiating towards the fingers on the lateral side. We have to look at the anatomy of median nerve to know this. So, today's lecture on median nerve will be covered under the following topics. In coming to introduction, then the origin and root value of a nerve course and relations because we need to know where it can get compressed or can get injured. Branches supplying various structures so that we can analyze the effects of disorders of this nerve. For example, an injury causing motor deficit or a sensory loss. And lastly, the applied anatomy of the nerve and we will conclude this with the summary. What is this median nerve? Why is it called so? The term median means it lies in the midline. Median nerve lies in the midline of the forearm as indicated by these two stars which highlight the median nerve here. So, it is lying in the midline of the forearm. So, it is called as median nerve. It is also called as laborer's nerve. Why is it so? Because it supplies the flexor muscles present in the forearm which are the large flexors which help in doing manual labor. So, it is called as laborer's nerve. It is also called as the eye of the hand. Do you think it is going to see? No, it is no, it's not going to see directly, but it is going to help us to identify structures by using our fingers, especially the thumb and the index finger which are always used when you want to identify the texture or any other uh, topic of uh, interest, you want to feel and identify a thing, then this is what you are going to use. So, it is also called as eye of the hand because it is going to supply most of this area of the skin of the palm of the hand. Let us look at the origin of median nerve. Median nerve is a branch coming from the brachial plexus. As we all know, brachial plexus has got a supraclavicular part and an infraclavicular part. The lateral cord and the medial cord, which are the parts of the brachial plexus giving origin to median nerve, will be in the infraclavicular part in relation to the axillary artery as their name suggests. So, you find the lateral cord lying lateral to the axillary artery and the medial cord lying medial to the axillary artery. The second and third part of the axillary artery will be related to this. You find the lateral cord is giving the lateral root here which is going to take part in the formation of median nerve and also the medial cord is giving a branch that is the medial root. You can see the medial root crossing the axillary artery superficially going laterally and joining the lateral root. We all know lateral cord is made up of fibers coming from the brachial plexus and these fibers will have a root value of C5, C6 and C7. C stands for the cervical spinal segments. 
medial cord has a root value of C8 and T1. 8 is coming from the cervical spinal segment 8 and 1 is from the thoracic spinal segment 1. These two will join together to join and form the median nerve. The appearance of median nerve, nerve resembles the letter M which makes us easily identify median nerve during the dissection. So, letter M where the medial part of the M, the two descending limbs uniting and forming the midline of the M is now representing the median nerve. The median nerve which is formed in the axilla by the union of these two roots will have the same root value. So, you find the lateral cord carrying the fibers 5, 6, 7 passing through the lateral root contributing these fibers to median nerve whereas the medial cord carrying the fibers C8 and T1 will pass these fibers via medial root to median nerve. So, median nerve ultimately has all the fibers of brachial plexus that is C5 to C8 and T1. Now, let us look at the course and relations in various parts of the upper limb where we will find the median nerve. This will include in the axilla, the arm, cubital fossa, forearm and the hand. Let us look at the course and relations of median nerve in the axilla. You find the axillary artery which is present in the axilla is the main topic which we will be using it as a reference to tell whether it is medial or lateral to this particular structure because all these branches of brachial plexus will be surrounding this axillary artery either they are lateral or medial or posterior or anterior. So, we find the median nerve lies lateral to the third part of the axillary artery. It lies between the axillary artery and the coracobrachialis muscle which is present here with its nerve that is the musculocutaneous nerve. So, you find the median nerve lying between coracobrachialis and axillary artery. It descends down in this direction to reach the lower border of teres major and beyond this point it will be entering the arm. In the arm, you find the median nerve lying me lateral to the brachial artery which is the continuation of the axillary artery up to the middle one third of the arm and this point of reference that is the middle one third of the arm is the same area where coracobrachialis muscle is going to get inserted. So, what happens is we tell certain changes taking place at the level of coracobrachialis insertion. One such structure changing its direction is median nerve. You find the median nerve which was lateral to the brachial artery in the proximal part will cross the brachial artery superficially and run on its medial side in the lower one third. So, in the middle of the arm median nerve is going to cross the brachial artery from lateral to medial side in a superficial way. So, this is one of the changes happening in the middle of the arm at the level of insertion of coracobrachialis. Now, the median nerve crossing the brachial artery will run on its medial side and then reach the cubital fossa. This fossa which is the next region which we are going to look at lies in front of the elbow region. Now, we have these structures in the cubital fossa from medial to lateral side. Medial most structure is the median nerve, next to it is the brachial artery, lateral to this is the biceps brachii muscle ending as a tendon and a bicipital aponeurosis and last structure on the lateral most side is the radial nerve which is slightly hidden deep to the muscles which are present on this border of cubital fossa that will be the brachioradialis and extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis. Now, you find the median nerve which has entered the cubital fossa running medial to the brachial artery is the medial most content of the cubital fossa. It descends down in the cubital fossa, it is crossed superficially by this aponeurosis of the biceps tendon. This aponeurosis is called as bicipital aponeurosis. This crosses superficially both the brachial artery and the median nerve and it is going to get inserted to the deep fascia of the forearm near the ulnar border. 
the median nerve which passes deep to bicipital aponeurosis will leave the cubital fossa by passing between the two heads of this muscle which is seen here which is a muscle forming one of the borders of the cubital fossa and this muscle is pronator teres. You find pronator teres has a humero ulnar head and a radial head. So, this humero ulnar head will be superficial to the median nerve whereas, the deep head will separate median nerve from the artery which is deeper to it and this is the ulnar artery. So, you find median nerve leaving the cubital fossa between the superficial and deep heads of pronator teres and deep to the deep head is ulnar artery and median nerve has crossed this from medial to lateral side. Now, the median nerve is going to enter the forearm by leaving the cubital fossa between the two heads of pronator teres. How does it exactly enter the forearm? It is going to pass deep to this tendinous arch and this tendinous arch is the tendon of flexor digitorum superficialis and this is the origin of flexor digitorum superficialis muscle. This muscle is a superficial flexor present in the forearm. So, you find this superficial flexor has got two attachments which are connected by a tendinous arch. One of the attachment is coming from the humerus and the ulna here and the other attachment is attached to the radius. So, between these two you find a tendinous arch and deep to this tendinous arch you find the median nerve and the ulnar artery passing. That is how median nerve is going to enter this part of the forearm now. So, as it enters the median nerve will pass deep to the superficial flexors. So, it will lie between the superficial flexor muscles of the forearm and the deep flexor muscles. The superficial flexor muscles have a common origin from the medial epicondyle of the humerus. So, you can see all these muscles radiating from there. They are the pronator teres, flexor carpa radialis, the palmaris longus, flexor digitorum superficialis and flexor carpi ulnaris. So, these five muscles belong to superficial group of muscles in the flexor compartment and you find the median nerve passing deep to this flexor muscle group that is the superficial group. It lies superficial to the deep group of muscles which we will see in the next slide. So, median nerve is deep to the superficial flexors whereas, it lies superficial to the deep flexors which are seen here. The superficial flexor muscles are removed here. So, you can see only the cut end of this muscles here. They belong to the superficial group whereas, the deep flexor muscles are intact here. So, you can see the deep flexors that is the flexor digitorum profundus, the flexor pollicis longus and the quadrangular muscle present only in the lower part covered by these tendons. This is the pronator quadratus. So, the median nerve is lying between the superficial and deep group of flexors in the forearm. Now, how does it leave the forearm? As it is descending down towards the lower end of the forearm, about 5 centimeters proximal to the flexor retinaculum. The tendon of uh, flexor car, uh, carpe radialis is seen here with the tendon of flexor digitorum superficialis and a tendon of median uh, palmaris longus also will be present. So, you find the median nerve emerges from the lateral border of the tendon of flexor digitorum superficialis and becomes a superficial content in the lower part of the forearm. Here it was behind the deeper or deeper to the superficial muscles, but now it has become a superficial content of the lower part of the forearm. This is important because any laceration here can cut the median nerve along with some important structures which are lying next to it here. So, a laceration can cut median nerve in the lower part of the forearm where it is superficial and it is lying between the tendon of flexa carpi radialis and the tendon of flexa digitorum superficialis. It can be crossed superficially by palmaris longus tendon. Sometimes you can get confused between the median nerve and the palmaris longus tendon, but the palmaris longus tendon has got a glistening appearance and it is whitish in color, whereas median nerve will have a dull appearance and it will have an artery accompanying it. 
which artery accompanies median nerve? It is going to be the artery accompanying median nerve, a branch coming from the anterior interosseous artery and this artery will be called as arteria nervi mediana, arteria nervi mediana. This arteria nervi mediana is a branch of anterior interosseous artery. It is going to accompany the median nerve for some distance and then it is going to end in the substance of median nerve. This artery is a remnant of axis artery of the upper limb. Axis artery of the upper limb is the artery which is present in the midline of the upper limb during the development. So, you find certain arteries which represent this axis artery and this arteria nervi mediana is one such artery. This will be found accompanying the median nerve. As the median nerve emerges deep from deep to uh, flexor digitorum superficialis tendon to become superficial, it is going to leave the forearm and enter the palm. How does it enter the palm? It is going to pass through a tunnel which is present here and this tunnel is deep to the flexor retinaculum superficial to the carpal bones. So, the flexor retinaculum attached to the carpal bones will convert this area into a tunnel which will be called as carpal tunnel. Please note this region is related to carpal tunnel. So, median nerve is going to pass through the carpal tunnel. So, it has to lie deep to the flexor retinaculum entering the palm through the carpal tunnel. Once it enters the palm, it is going to lie in the palm where it is going to terminate. This termination happens in the palm distal to the flexor retinaculum deep to the deep fascia of the palm which is thickened here to form what is called as palmar aponeurosis. So, distal part of the palm here you find a triangular thickening of the deep fascia which is called as palmar aponeurosis. So, deep to this you find the median nerve. It is also deep to an arterial arch which is present here and that will be the superficial palmar arch. So, it lies deep to the superficial palmar arch, deep to the palmar aponeurosis and then terminates. It is superficial to the tendons which can be seen here. These are the long flexor tendons coming from the fora. They are enclosed in a synovial sheath which can be seen here and this synovial sheath is called as ulnar bursa. So, it is superficial to the long flexor tendons and their ulnar bursa. It is deep to the palmar aponeurosis and the superficial palmar arch. Here the median nerve is going to terminate by dividing into two branches, a medial branch and a lateral branch which are going to supply branches to the digits and that will be the lateral three and a half digit. The lateral three digits will be the thumb, the index finger and the middle finger and half of the ring finger will be supplied by the median nerve. So, you find median nerve supplying cutaneous supply to lateral three and a half digits and the corresponding part of the palm thereby supplying almost two-thirds of the skin over the palmar aspect of the hand. Hence, it is also called as the eye of the hand. Now, let us look at the branches given by median nerve in the arm. In the axilla, the median nerve does not give any branches, whereas in the arm, it can supply vasomotor branches to the artery which is closely associated with and that is the brachial artery. So, it gives vasomotor branches to brachial artery. It also gives in the lower part of the arm a muscular branch which is going to supply the pronator teres muscle which is forming the medial border of cubital fossa. So, you find median nerve supplying one muscle when it is lying in the lower part of the arm itself and that is pronator teres. You can see this branch coming from the median nerve supplying pronator teres here. 
then it is going to leave the cubital fossa between the two heads of pronator teres and just as it leaves or just before it leaves, it is going to give branches to most of the superficial flexors of the forearm and that will be the flexor carpi radialis, the flexor digitorum superficialis and the palmaris longus. These three muscles will be supplied by median nerve as it leaves the cubital fossa. Flexor digitorum superficialis will be uh, having four tendons which will go to the medial four digits. The medial nerve branch one arising to the index finger can arise little lower down in the forearm. So, somewhere below the middle of the forearm median nerve can give a branch which is going to supply the index finger part of the superficial flexor group that will be the flexor digitorum superficialis muscle. We have to keep this in mind because when we talk about the applied anatomy, we will be referring back to this branch supplying the index tendon of flexor digitorum superficialis. Next, the median nerve once it enters the forearm, it is going to lie between deep to the flexor digitorum superficialis and it gives off an important branch here. So, after supplying all these muscles and that is the deep branch of median nerve which will be called as anterior introsious nerve. This is the anterior introsious nerve which is going to supply the deep group of flexor muscles except for the medial one and half muscles that will be it is going to supply flexor pollicis longus which is going to go to the thumb, flexor digitorum profundus the lateral half which will have tendons going to the index and the middle finger and this quadrangular muscle in the lower part that is pronator quadratus. So, these two and a half muscles are supplied by anterior introsious nerve a branch coming from the median nerve. The other one and half muscles present among this deep group will be supplied by the nerve which is coming here and that is ulnar nerve. So, it is going to supply the flexor carpi ulnaris and the medial half of flexor digitorum profundus. So, you find median nerve supplies most of the muscles of the flexor compartment except for two muscles along the medial side, one is flexor carpi ulnaris and the other half of the flexor digitorum profundus and that is the medial half not supplied by median nerve. These one and half muscles will be supplied by ulnar nerve. So, the main nerve in the forearm is median nerve in the flexor compartment either directly or through its anterior introsious branch. As it comes down, you find the median nerve will give one more branch and that is the palmar cutaneous branch. This palmar cutaneous branch of median nerve will arise from the median nerve above the flexor retinaculum that is proximal to the flexor retinaculum and it will descend down to supply the palm as the name indicates it is a palmar cutaneous branch. So, it is going to supply the palm. How does it descend down is important. It is going to be superficial to this deep facial thickening and that is the flexor retinaculum. So, palmar cutaneous branch will pass superficial to flexor retinaculum to reach the palm. Please note this relation. It is an important relation whereby you can differentiate the no uh, injury whether it is at a higher level or it is deep to the carpal tunnel. So, that is the palmar cutaneous branch. What does this do palmar cutaneous branch? It is going to supply the central region of the palm and also the skin over the thenar eminence. So, skin over the thenar eminence and the center of the palm is supplied by palmar cutaneous branch which is crossing superficial to flexor retinaculum. Now, we have seen median nerve entering the palm deep to the flexor retinaculum and once it enters it is going to terminate by dividing into two branches that will be the medial and the lateral branch. You find the lateral branch can give a recurrent branch which is seen here and this recurrent branch is a muscular branch. It can arise directly from the median nerve before its termination or it can be a branch of the lateral terminal division. 
this recurrent muscular branch is going to supply the thenar group of muscles and that will be the abductor pollicis brevis, flexor pollicis brevis and opponent's pollicis. These three muscles lying in the thenar eminence will be supplied by the recurrent muscular branch. You find then the lateral terminal branch dividing into three branches which are proper palmar digital branches. These proper palmar digital branches, two of them will supply the thumb, the lateral and the medial side of the thumb, whereas one is going to supply the radial side of the index finger. The proper palmar digital branch going to the radial side of the index finger is giving off a branch here. Can you please see here? This is the branch going to the first lumbrical muscle. Lumbrical muscles are worm-like muscles which are present in the palm. They take origin from the flexor tendon that is belonging to the profundus, flexor digitorum profundus tendon. They take their origin here and they are going to get inserted to the dorsal digital expansion. After they cross the metacarpophalangeal joint and they go backwards they, to the dorsal aspect, they will be getting inserted to the dorsal digital expansion. So, these lumbrical muscles, they are the worm-like muscles present here. There are four in number. The lateral two are supplied by median nerve and the medial two by the ulnar nerve. Their action can be remembered by looking at this movement. So, you find the lumbrical muscles bringing about flexion at the metacarpophalangeal joint. So, this movement is brought about by the lumbrical muscle. So, if they are involved in any injury, this movement becomes weak. This is flexion at the metacarpophalangeal joint. So, lateral 2 will be supplied, as said, by the median nerve. We have seen now the first lumbrical supplied by the proper digital branch of median nerve going to the radial side of index finger, giving a branch to the first lumbrical. So, which nerve is going to supply the second lumbrical from which branch? We are going to see this now. This is the medial terminal branch. Now, we see medial terminal branch is dividing into two nerves. These two are common palmar digital nerves. Common palmar digital nerves, each one will have to divide into two proper digital nerves. They will be supplying the adjoining sides of the index and the middle finger and this branch will be supplying adjoining sides of the middle and the ring finger. So, the first common palmar digital nerve coming from the medial termination will give a branch as you can see here which will go into supply the second lumbrical. After giving this motor branch to second lumbrical, it is going to divide into two proper palmar digital branches which will come towards this cleft and going to supply the adjacent sides of the index and the middle finger. The other division that is the common palmar digital branch coming from the medial terminal branch will give another branch. This branch is not a motor branch, it is a communicating branch. So, this communicating branch is going to communicate with this nerve which is present on the medial side of the palm and that is the ulnar nerve. So, there is a communication between the median nerve and ulnar nerve in the palm. This communicating branch will be joining with the branch coming from the ulnar nerve and thereby it can supply sensory supply to the medial part of the palm or the ulnar area here. So, there can be a confusion when we look at the sensory loss because through the communicating branch the median nerve can also supply this area and if there is an injury there can be sensory loss even in this area which is the area of ulnar nerve. So, these communications become important. Similarly, communications higher up in the forearm which are called as Martin Gruber connections. They are called as Martin Gruber connections. These Martin Gruber connections are communications between the median nerve and ulnar nerve. They exist in the forearm 
and what happens is the nerve fibers which pass from the median nerve to the ulnar nerve go and supply various other muscles. So, there can be an enigma of uh, deformity resulting when there is an injury to median nerve which muscle is supplied by median nerve depends upon this Martin Gruber connection and there can be unexplained paralysis of some intrinsic muscles of the hand which normally are not innervated by median nerve seen in median nerve injury. This is due to the Martin Gruber connection that is connections existing between median nerve and ulnar nerve. So, now we have seen the termination of the median nerve here the lateral terminal branch giving a recurrent motor branch to the thenar muscles that is the abductor pollicis brevis, flexor pollicis brevis and opponens pollicis which will be acting on the thumb and dividing into three proper digital branches out of which the digital branch going to the index finger will also give a branch to supply the first lumbrical. The medial terminal branch is going to divide into two common palmar digital nerves the lateral one is going to divide and supply the adjoining sides of the index and the middle finger. It is also going to supply the second lumbrical. The lateral common palmar digital nerve will give a communicating branch to ulnar nerve and then terminate by dividing into two proper palmar digital nerves which will supply the middle and the ring finger. So, with this you have seen the sensory supply of median nerve to the lateral three and a half digits and also the three muscles which are present here in the thenar group and also the first and the second lumbrical. So, that is the nerve supply of median nerve in the hand. To summarize the branches which arise you found a vascular branch supplying the brachial artery when it is lying in the arm. In the lower part of the arm it supplied this muscle that is the pronator teres. It also gave in front of the elbow just before leaving into the cub uh, uh, leaving the cubital fossa into the forearm the three superficial group of muscles supplied by the median nerve that will be the flexor carpi radialis, palmaris longus and flexor digitorum superficialis. When it is lying in front of the elbow it also supplies the two joints that is the articular branch given to the elbow and the superior radioulnar joint. As it descends down you find the most important deep branch arising from the median nerve that is the anterior introsious nerve which lies anterior to the introsious membrane accompanying by the anterior introsious artery and this is going to supply these muscles. This will be the flexor pollicis longus, this will be the lateral half of flexor digitorum profundus and pronator quadratus. This anterior introsious nerve is uh, going to end by supplying the joints lower down that will be the distal radio ulnar joint, the carpal joint and also the intercarpal joints. So, it supplies the distal radio ulnar, the wrist joint and the intercarpal joints. It also gave a cutaneous branch in the forearm and that is the palmar cutaneous branch. This passed superficial to flexor retinaculum to supply the skin over the palm and that is the center area and the skin over the thenar eminence. Then you found the median nerve entering the palm deep to the flexor retinaculum giving off a recurrent branch which is going to supply three muscles abductor pollicis brevis, flexor pollicis brevis and opponens pollicis dividing into a lateral terminal and a medial terminal branch lateral terminal branch is going to give three digital branches out of which proper digital branches two of them will supply the thumb whereas the third one supplying the index finger radial side is also going to supply the first lumbrical. The medial terminal branch dividing into two and that will be the medial palmar common palmar digital branch which gives a branch to the second lumbrical and divide and supply the adjoining surfaces of the index and the middle finger. The lateral common palmar digital branch is going to give a communicating branch to ulnar nerve and divide and give proper palmar digital branches to the adjoining surfaces of the middle and the ring finger. So, that is the branches and supply area of supply of median nerve. This diagram shows you the branches which are going to supply the hand. 
please remember the proper palmar digital branches whether they are coming from the medial nerve or from the ulnar nerve will give off dorsal branches which will also supply the skin over the dorsum of the middle and terminal phalanges in the index and the uh, middle and the ring finger and in case of the thumb in the medial nerve it is going to supply the skin over the dorsum of the distal phalanx alone. So, that is by the proper palmar digital branches giving off dorsal branches to supply the skin also. This can be explained embryologically because the nail bed is going to appear towards the palmar aspect, the tip of the hand and as further development happens with the growth of the embryo, you find the nail bed projecting backwards, growing upwards and going dorsally, carrying its nerve supply, thereby pulling the nerve which is going to supply it in this area towards the back. So, you find a proper palmar digital branch supplying this area also. That is the middle phalanx and the terminal phalanx in these two fingers, index, ring and the middle finger, whereas the distal phalanx alone in the thumb. Let us look at the applied anatomy of median nerve. Pronator syndrome. Pronator syndrome is a syndrome which causes pain to the patient when he does pronation. When we look at the hand, you find if the palm is facing upwards that is supination and when you turn it, rotate it downwards so that the palm faces down, this is called as pronation. So, this is supination and this is pronation. So, if a patient tries to pronate the hand, it is going to increase the pain. This is called as pronator syndrome. What is the cause of pronator syndrome is entrapment neuropathy of the median nerve. It gets compressed deep to some structures like one of them can be ligament of struthers. Ligament of struthers is present in 17 percent of the population. It is a ligament which connects a small spur which can be present in the humerus above the medial condyle with an accessory head of pronator teres. In lower animals, you find three heads for coracobrachialis. One of them is an accessory head. This can be attached to the ligament of struthers, forming a ligament of struthers to the spur on the medial epicondyle of the humerus. So, this ligament will be superficial to the median nerve, thereby compressing the median nerve as it passes deep to it. So, ligament of struthers is a ligament connecting the spur present on the medial epicondyle to the accessory head of coracobrachialis which is occasionally present. This is seen in 17 percent of the population. Next, it can get compressed deep to the bicipital aponeurosis as it runs in the cubital fossa or it can get compressed by the tendinous edge of deep head of pronator teres or by the radial head of flexa digitorum superficialis as it is passing deep to the tendinous arch and entering the forearm flexa compartment. It can also get injured in supracondylar fracture of the humerus. That will be a fracture happening above the condyles of the humerus. It can involve the median nerve. Median nerve can also get divided or lacerated just above the flexor retinaculum as it lies superficially in the wrist region. We have already spoken about Martin Gruber connection and its importance. Please remember there can be communication between the median nerve and ulnar nerve. So, during these injuries, you can have unexplained paralysis of certain extra muscles in the palm. They are the intrinsic muscles of the palm and that will be due to the fibers of median nerve going via ulnar nerve to supply these muscles. So, this connection is called as Martin Gruber connection. Let us look at the injuries at different levels. Now, carpal tunnel syndrome is compression of median nerve as it passes through the carpal tunnel which is in front of the wrist. So, median nerve can get compressed here. Causes of carpal tunnel can vary. It can be a physiological condition like pregnancy where there can be edema as we saw with the clinical case which we spoke about initially or it can be due to other conditions like myxedema, 
with thyroid dysfunction or it can be due to a dislocation of one of the carpal bones one of the carpal bones which can get dislocated towards the palmar aspect is the lunate because it has a larger palmar surface area when there is injury towards the wrist a person can have a lunate dislocation towards the palmar aspect so as it gets dislocated it will narrow the carpal tunnel thereby compressing the median nerve median nerve can also get compressed due to inflammation of the bursa which is present here bursa is nothing but the synovial sheath of the long flexor tendons you find two bursae here one is the ulnar bursa which will involve the long flexor tendons of the uh, forearm that will be the flexor digitorum superficialis and flexor digitorum profundus surrounding this is a bursa which is called as ulnar bursa laterally is another bursa which encloses the tendon of flexor pollicis longus that will be called as radial bursa inflammation of these bursae which increase in size due to inflammation with the edema can compress the median nerve which is superficial to the ulnar bursa so you find median nerve sandwiched between flexor retinaculum and the ulnar bursa so it can get compressed when these bursa undergo inflammation inflammation of bursa is called as bursitis so all these conditions can result in compression of median nerve in the carpal tunnel which will be now called as carpal tunnel syndrome a person will have excruciating pain along the distribution of the median nerve in the palm they do not have any sensory disturbances in which area do you think they don't have sensory disturbance which was the cutaneous branch which took origin proximal to the wrist as we saw earlier yeah that was the palmar cutaneous branch of median nerve arising proximal to the flexor retinaculum so that would have supplied this area that's the center of the palm and the thinar eminence skin so this area will not show any sensory loss or sensory disturbance whereas all the other cutaneous branches supplying the lateral 3 and 1/2 digits coming from median nerve beyond the flexor retinaculum will be affected so there can be sensory loss along this area it also gives off a muscular branch as it lies in the palm what was that called as yes it had a recurring course going towards the thinar eminence so this branch was called as the recurrent branch the recurrent motor branch supplying the thinar muscles so even that will be affected because it is arising distal to the carpal tunnel so the compression will affect it so which are the muscles now paralyzed because of this that will be the thinar group of muscles that is the abductor pollicis brevis lying laterally flexor pollicis brevis lying medially and deeper to this is opponent's pollicis so these three muscles can get paralyzed when there is carpal tunnel syndrome so what's the action by contraction of abductor pollicis brevis what do we do now this is the thumb you can keep the thumb adducted so the thumb is now next to the digits in the same plane as the rest of the palm so it is in the same plane as the rest of the palm and it is adducted if you want to abduct the thumb you are going to lift the thumb at 90 degrees or perpendicular to the plane of the palm so this is abduction brought about by abductor pollicis brevis supplied by median nerve now this movement is not possible so a person will not be able to abduct the thumb because of or there can be a weakness in abduction because of paralysis of abductor pollicis brevis the other two muscles one is flexor pollicis brevis brings about the action of flexion which is shown this way this is flexion where the thumb is brought in front of the palm so this is flexion of the thumb and the other muscle is opponents where we use to touch the pulp of the other finger tips by moving the thumb you are going to touch the pulp of the other finger tips so this is called as opposition now when we want to test the where recurrent motor branch intactness you can do this movement where you'll be doing abduction and opposition you're going to hold or touch the pulp of the index finger by bringing these two digits together so this is a test which can be done to see whether the 
recurrent motor branch of median nerve is intact and these muscles are in good condition. So, these three muscles are involved. Also involved will be the two lumbricals supplied by median nerve in the palm that will be the first and the second lumbrical. By doing a phalanx test, you can confirm whether median nerve is compressed within the carpal tunnel. The picture shows that this phalanx test is done by doing extreme flexion. This is how it will be tested. With this movement, you find the median nerve compression increases. So, patient will have excruciating pain along the distribution of the median nerve. This test is called as phalanx test. Tinnel sign also can be positive. If you tap the flexor retinaculum area, that is the area between the lateral and the medial pillars of the carpal bones. The lateral pillar area which you can identify on the surface is the tubercle of scaphoid and the crest of trapezium lying on the lateral side. And on the medial side is the pisiform and the hook of hamate. So, these will give attachment to the flexor retinaculum. So, between these pillars, if you tap the area, that is the area where the flexor retinaculum will be, you will be tapping against the flexor retinaculum and the median nerve underneath it, thereby the person will have pain if there is compression of median nerve. This is tinnel sign. Next, a deformity which can result from median nerve injury is pointing index finger deformity. You can see the index finger is pointing upwards. Why is it so? Median nerve is going to supply the flexor digitorum superficialis and profundus through its branches which arise in the forearm. The branch which is going to supply the muscle which gives rise to the tendon going to the index finger, this finger that is the flexor digitorum superficialis tendon coming to the index finger this part of the muscle will be supplied by a branch coming from the median nerve slightly lower down than the rest. So, if median nerve gets injured at this level where a branch is arising to the index finger, you find the muscle supplying or uh, acting on the other fingers are intact whereas, the muscle which is coming to the index finger is paralyzed. So, if a person tries to make a fist you find the index finger lags behind pointing upwards. So, it is called as pointing index finger deformity and this is due to flexor digitorum superficialis muscle being paralyzed which is supplied slightly lower down in the forearm when compared to the other branches. The other hand deformity which can be seen in median nerve injury is hand of benediction. This hand of benediction is where the two fingers on the lateral side that is the index finger and the middle finger do not flex similar to the medial two fingers. So, they are slightly extended more so in case of index when compared to the middle finger and the thumb is also in an extended position. This deformity is called as hand of benediction and this is due to injury of median nerve in the lower part of the forearm involving the anterior interosseous nerve. The superficial flexors to this is intact that will be to the ring finger and the little finger and also to the middle finger. These three superficial flexors will be intact because they are given off as median nerve emerges between the two heads of pronator teres proximal to flexor digitorum superficialis arch. So, they are intact. Beyond this when it gets injured, you find the median nerve injury results in anterior interosseous nerve injury. Thereby, these fingers will not have flexor digitorum profundus acting. It will be paralyzed, the tendon going to index and the tendon going to the middle finger. The tendon of flexor digitorum superficialis going to the ring finger sorry index finger is also paralyzed because that arises at slightly at a lower down position. So, you find the index finger is much more lagging behind when compared to the middle finger where the superficialis tendon is intact. So, only you find this slightly being flexed. Whereas, the flexor pollicis longus and the opponent's pollicis and abductor pollicis are 
being paralyzed whereas extensor pollicis longus will be intact. So, you find the hand is the thumb is not flexed or abducted towards the wrist uh, towards the palm thereby forming a uh, fist you find the thumb being extended. So, this is hand of benediction where these three fingers do not take part in the formation of a fist that will be the thumb, the index finger and the middle finger. Next going on to ape thumb deformity, we have already know the thenar heminence muscles, the superficial ones which are present here, abductor pollicis brevis, flexor pollicis brevis medially and deeper to these two will be the opponent's pollicis is paralyzed if the median nerve is injured anywhere because even in the carpal tunnel it can get paralyzed unless median nerve injury is only to the digital branches. Okay? Otherwise this ape thumb deformity will result with median nerve injury anywhere higher up from the palm upwards. So, what happens is paralysis of these three muscles will result in extension of the thumb and being very adduct in an adducted position. They can extend the thumb because of extensor pollicis longus or it is kept in adducted position due to adductor pollicis being intact. There is flattening of the thenar eminence. There is flattening of the thenar eminence because of paralysis of the three muscles and thereby they result in flattening of this area without much muscular activity. So, this is called as ape thumb deformity. Another sign which can be positive in median nerve injury is from and sign. This can be tested by asking the patient to hold a book, it is also called as book holding test or it can be tested even with a paper, paper holding test. Normally what happens is you find the abductor pollicis and the opponent's pollicis has to be intact for you to touch the pulp of the thumb with the pulp of the index finger or bring it towards the index finger itself. This is not possible when there is a paralysis of these two muscles. So, if you are trying to put the abductor pollicis and the opponent's pollicis, you bring these two pulps together. This is not possible while doing this test. This is called as Froman's sign. Froman's sign is positive in median nerve injury. Anterior introsious syndrome, if median nerve branch anterior introsious nerve alone is injured, then it results in anterior introsious syndrome. What does this give rise to is, you can test by doing this that is OK sign. When we tell OK, we are holding the pulp of the thumb touching the pulp of the index finger. This is called as OK sign. This is not possible in case of anterior introsious syndrome. If a patient si uh, tries to do the OK sign, what happens is there is this condition resulting. You find the thumb, the whole area of the palmar surface of the thumb coming in contact with the palmar surface of the distal two phalanges of the index finger. This is a triangular sign. Instead of an OK sign, you are getting a triangular sign. This is seen in anterior introsious syndrome because of injury to the flexor pollicis longus which is going to act on the thumb flexor pollicis longus and also flexor digitorum profundus to do these two that will be the flexor digitorum profundus tendon to the index and the middle finger that will be injured. So, you find this pinch grip which is going to help in holding picking up things that will become very weak weakness of the pinch grip. With this, we will be completing the median nerve. Let us look at the summary of median nerve. As we saw, median nerve, a branch coming from the brachial plexus formed by the medial root arising from the medial cord and a lateral root arising from the lateral cord were having the root value of C5, C6, C7 via lateral root and C8 and T1 via the medial root formed the median nerve lateral to the axillary artery, third part of the axillary artery. You can see the medial root crossing superficial to the axillary artery, joining the lateral root. It descended to reach the middle of the arm lying lateral to the brachial artery. In the middle of the arm, it crossed superficial to brachial artery and then started running on the medial side of the brachial artery. 
in the cubital fossa it was deep to bicipital aponeurosis left the cubital fossa between the two heads of pronator teres it supplied the pronator teres here itself gave branches to the superficial flexors in the forearm that will be the flexor carpi radialis fle palmaris longus and flexor distorum superficialis left the cubital fossa entered the forearm deep to the tendinous arch of flexor distorum superficialis gave the anterior interosseous nerve which supplied the two and a half muscles among the deep group that will be the flexor pollicis longus lateral half of flexor distorum profundus and the pronator quadratus and it gave a palmar cutaneous branch which passed superficial to the flexor retinaculum to supply the center of the palm and the skin over the thenar eminence. So, because of this branch the palmar branch you find injury of median nerve above this level above the palmar branch level will have sensory loss in this area along with sensory loss in the lateral three and a half digits whereas if it is injured distal to the palmar cutaneous branch you find the injury will not result in sensory loss in the center of the palm and the thenar eminence area but it will have sensory loss in the three and a half digits so this point can be kept in mind to differentiate between injury of median nerve proximal or distal to the palmar cutaneous branch. Then you found the termination of the median nerve after entering through the carpal tunnel in the palm into a medial and a lateral branch. In the, the lateral branch supplied these three muscles via the recurrent motor branch and then divided to supply the cutaneous innervation to the lateral two and a, three and a half digits along with the two lumbricals. Along with these, it also gave branches to the joints that will be the elbow joint, proximal radial nerve joint, distal radial nerve joint, the wrist joint and the intercarpal joints. So, other than muscular branches, median nerve gave vascular branches and articular branches to the joints. So, with this, we will be completing one of the most important nerves in the upper limb and that is median nerve. Thank you.